Uh, I was going to say first um, to thank you, Jörg, for reminding us the terrible human tragedy that is happening very close to us. There are many human tragedies that are happening, but the one in Ukraine, well, it's close to me also personally because I'm Romanian. Um, I, was, I had in mind to make some jokes throughout this presentation. Uh, I, will I, I will continue with this plan. If you forgive me, I grew up in socialism. We used to make fun of terrible times. That was our way to cope with it. Um, you're welcome to laugh with me or not, depending on how uh, your social conditioning uh, was. Uh, what I want to do today, uh, just to give you the punchline, I suppose, compared to, uh, or in contrast to the previous speaker, uh, um, uh, Michael Jacobs, uh, I want to tell you that uh, my view, and Ben now has to share this view with me, since uh, this is a keynote referring to, to work that we are both doing, uh, but he's not going to join me here uh, for reasons of saving you time. Uh, the, the punchline is that we do not see an end of times or an end of eras. We actually live, continue to live under the status quo of financial capitalism, a, a, a macro financial regime that has been in place for the last 40 years. And when we think about decarbonization, we have to think about this particular uh, status quo that is transforming and morphing for uh, private financial capital to be able to deal with the crisis and uh, monetize it one way or another. And I was supposed to have some slides. Uh, Is the, oh, see? Very good. So uh, this is joint work with, with Ben Brown, um, drawing on a, a theoretical lens that I and several others have developed uh, that we describe as, as critical uh, macrofinance. And uh, to, to, to just remind you where we are now when we speak, I mean, I cannot share in many ways the enthusiasm of the previous speaker for your chancellor for a, for a variety of reasons, mostly macroeconomic, uh, but to remind you that for an economist and for a macroeconomist trained and, uh, in uh, macroeconomics in the last 20 to 30 years, which is where I put myself, the real Zeitenwende is not uh, the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, but the fact that central planning or planning is back on the um, pages of the Financial Times and in conversations that we have been having over the last three to five months uh, in relationship to uh, the uh, climate transition and to uh, questions of how to organize. Once we agree that the climate crisis is real, the question becomes how, to, how do we organize decarbonization uh, as a macroeconomic and uh, as a macroeconomic uh, project. And I've given, we've given you three examples here of the way in which pl uh, planning is coming back. Not j uh, Max Krahe uh, introduced it and discussed it in, in terms of the importance of reviving some intuitions of, of indicative planning in relationship to the climate crisis. But I suppose what in some ways is, is more um, uh, politically interesting is the fact that uh, mainstream macroeconomists in, in policy circles are discussing the question of uh, planning within the context of a war economy, including a climate, uh, if you are a climate war economy. Jean Pisan Pisani Ferry has published uh, a recent piece, as well as um, uh, Martin Sandbu uh, in the Financial Times. Um, and as we, we the, the question of planning is coming back. Um, what we think is missing from the, the, the discussions on climate policies in general uh, and uh, the particular uh, conversations around planning is uh, the macro financial aspect. In other words, the combination of macroeconomic institutions and private financial institutions that will shape the path of decarbonization. And in order to think about this question, how do we locate decarbonization uh, trajectories within the existing status quo of financial capitalism, uh, we think or we introduce the concept of green macrofinancial regimes, by which we mean institutional modes of creating and stabilizing green financial and industrial capital. And the stability here comes particularly in relationship to uh, the pre the, one of the speaker's comments around the financial crisis and the specific nature of financial crisis in the last 20 to 30 years. And uh, I want to propose to you three different green macrofinancial regimes that we have seen emerging 
one way or another, either in policy discourse or in actual uh, reality. Um, the first one, uh, you will not be familiar maybe with the term, but the intuition uh, is quite familiar to many of you. Uh, we have called this carbon shock therapy in work that I've done with uh, Isabella Weber. Um, and the intuition of carbon shock therapy is very much a, a neoclassical intuition about getting prices right. The idea is that we, all we need to do in order to accelerate decarbonization is to stop governments from subsidizing uh, fossil fuels or high carbon activities. If the, uh, politicians were convinced to increase carbon prices, everything will work out, right? Because the market will adjust to price signals and nothing else needs to change. This is a very reassuring narrative in some ways because it says we can continue with central banks dominating the macro architecture, targeting inflation. We can continue with the logic of fiscal austerity. We don't need to have massive investment plans. All we need is to put in place is um, higher uh, carbon prices. And we've written a piece about this last year, just before uh, the COP26 in Glasgow, in the Financial Times, you're welcome to read it, where we draw a parale parallel between the discourse on transition to a low carbon economy with a discourse on transition from uh, centrally planned to uh, market economies in Eastern Europe and in, and in Russia. And what we argue th uh, in that piece, and we, we were working on a paper as well, is that there are some uncanny parallels in the way that, that the language of transition uh, uh, that is coming from more, let's say, right-wing or conservative circles that accept the climate crisis, these uncanny parallels are there. And the logic is we need structural transformation. Right? We need structural transformations of, of economies. And in the early 1990s, the logic was we need to push out or we need to discipline to subject state-owned companies in, formerly, uh, in, in centrally planned economies to, uh, the law, to the discipline of the market, which is the same as subjecting uh, fossil fuel companies or high carbon activities to uh, the disciplining hand of the market with mar better market uh, signals. And what did this uh, imply in practice? Well, we, uh, the, the advice was for countries to increase prices at which companies were accessing primary commodities or in, in our uh, parallel story, uh, uh, fossil fuels or, or high carbon uh, inputs, and to supplement this with monetary and fiscal uh, austerity. The idea was not to allow state-owned companies breathing space macroeconomically in, uh, in order to be able to circumvent the disciplining hand of the, of the market. And what we know from the early years, early 1990s in Eastern Europe uh, is that uh, Shock therapy was imposed by underbalance of payment crisis by the IMF, the World Bank, the institutions that we largely describe as the institutions of the Washington uh, consensus in local coalitions with central banks. Central banks had particular stakes in, propo in promoting shock, uh, shock therapy uh, and very much against political opposition and contestation because it generated very significant job losses and very significant disorderly transitions. And we argue in that uh, piece in the Financial Times uh, that carbon shock therapy in some ways will, uh, will generate the same kind of the similar disorderly dynamics in that the structure, sub, uh, subjecting companies to the structural transformation, to structural transformation through higher carbon prices will generate a, a unemployment and will generate significant political troubles. And in many ways, we didn't expect when you wrote this piece, uh, we were uh, speculating that this might happen in uh, countries in the global south uh, who were um, uh, going to come again under the, the um, pressure from the IMF to do structural uh, or carbon shock therapy because of the growing crisis uh, of external debt in um, countries in the global south. We didn't expect that the Russian invasion of Ukraine would basically generate a kind of exogenous carbon shock therapy. This is what we are seeing now. I'm happy to discuss this further. Uh, but I would argue, and I think the, the debate in Germany is very interesting in terms of thinking through how governments react to carbon shock therapy under a regime of monetary and fiscal austerity. Um, but this is where we are now. Uh, the, 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 there is not a policy-driven increase in carbon prices, but an, an exogenous shock, a geopolitical um, um, increase in carbon prices. And we, we are seeing, we argue, the effects of this today. 
the, the, the prevailing macrofinancial regime that we have now, as opposed to the carbon shock therapy that sort of materialized over the last three months since uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, is what I call or we call the small green state, um, drawing on work that I've done to, tr to trace the, the discourses around mobilizing private finance for the SDGs, for the Sustainable Development Goals, in countries in the Global South. And the logic here is very much the logic of financial capitalism uh, of asking why are we not getting in private investment in, private investment in climate-related activities or low-carbon activities or clean uh, tech or clean infrastructure. And the story that private finance has is the risk return profile is not right. In other words, risks are too high compared to returns or returns are too low compared to, to risks. And the answer that we have seen in this uh, paradigm is to say, well, governments have to create enabling environments. And if you read some of the speeches, I don't want to be uh, impolite to, the ho to, the, to my hosts here, but if we read some of the speeches of uh, the new German government and of the, uh, including of the Greens, the logic of mobilizing private capital and of creating enabling uh, environments is very powerful, both here in Germany, but also in many other different policy spaces, including in the IPCC report in chapter 15 on financing the green uh, transition. And the logic here is that prices matter, of course, price signals matter. It would be great if we had higher carbon prices, but we don't for the moment. Um, competition also matters, but since the political realities are as such that we do not get higher carbon prices, what the state needs to do in a sort of ordo liberal manner is to create the conditions for private capital to invest or to, to generate and accelerate the low carbon transition. And I want to give you the example of, and I, I, I'm, I'm interested to have a conversation about this because it may or may not be controversial, but I, we argue that if you look at German, Germany's energy policy since the uh, 1990s, it is a very good example, particularly the, um, sorry, I, I described this in, in an article that I, uh, Jacob, uh, in Jacob in Germany that was published recently. It, it's, it's in German, but it's not me. Uh, there was a very nice translator who worked very hard to, to translate 8,000 words. Uh, and the background of that um, article is to ask, how do we understand the fact that Germany um, was a pioneer in accelerating the transition towards renewable energies, both manufacturing and consumption of energy? But if you look at uh, the um, top 10 clean tech companies in either um, wind turbine manufacturing or in solar panels, they're all Chinese. And I think the story of this is a story of how the de-risking state and this idea of the small green state focuses very much the logic of, on creating markets, not industries. Uh, and, that's, and to give you an example of that, uh, there, there is a literature that argues the most famous policy export that Germany has done uh, is feed-in tariffs. I would say it's ordo liberalism, but uh, that's a, a, a longer debate. And uh, if, I re if I'm to remind you, and I'm happy to be corrected if this is the wrong interpretation, but the, in the, uh, the German energy policy basically assumed demand risk, went with the same logic of there is, because there is, a, not a market in, there is no market in renewables, we can construct one by changing the risk return profiles on um, 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 uh, solar panels or renewable energy uh, assets, both financial and industrial, and that's why our macrofinancial regime definition matters, with the idea of both creating green citizen producers or enlisting households in producing uh, green energy, with also with the uh, or the liberal idea of fighting back against energy uh, utilities, large utilities that were dominating the market, um, and. Uh, because of the logic of the small de-risking state, the macro, macroeconomic arrangement around it was to transfer the cost of this policy to uh, households and businesses. And there is a longer conversation there around who ended up paying for it, but um, we argue, um, and, I, and, and I think this would be an interesting conversation or, or research question to uh, develop in, in greater detail on what were the failures, and there are several scholars we know that have done this, uh, what, what, are the, the, what is the explanation of the, both the failure to generate industrial champions from there, but also the debates around um, 
in a sense, I, I would argue, the failure to accelerate or to accept the pace of transformation in the renewable sector uh, on macroeconomic grounds, right? There was, in, as I understand it, around 2000, after 2010, there were arguments in German governments and in, German, in the German political sphere that Germany was moving too fast towards re the renewable energy, which is very ironic given where we are now uh, in uh, the European energy um, discussions. And in part, uh, and that's a quote that we've taken from a German uh, renewable energy expert, in part, uh, this was due to the fact that the logic of the small green state or, or of the risking is to create markets, not industries. It's not to have a an, an vertical industrial policy where you choose winners, but to have a horizontal support for the market to, and for uh, businesses to freely allocate capital and to freely invest. Uh, in renewable energy. And in the work that I have done over the last three to four years, I show how this logic of de-risking is now very prevalent in debates around how to um, uh, achieve the sustainable development goals in countries in the global south, uh, where the, there is an additional layering of institutional capital, or what Ben Brown calls asset manager capitalism, in the sense that it involves politically and structurally uh, private institutional capital that uh, has trillions in assets under management. And the idea is, how do we get these trillions to go into um, asset classes or to, to support uh, asset classes that would accelerate the, the SDGs? And, uh, I, I, for example, if you look at the debates now around uh, uh, creating LNG infrastructure here in Germany and in Europe, you will see the logic of the risking is there as well in the, in the sense that the, uh, both financiers and uh, businesses are asking the, the state to de-risk demand, to guarantee a price for 20 years in order for private investment to occur. And that's, to me, a continuity from the uh, German policies around FIT. Um, very quickly, what are the risks? And, and I think this is why I, th why I would disagree with Michael Jacobs that we are at the end of an era, or uh, we are in the middle of an era of financial capitalism. And there are three important risks that I would like to, to very quickly uh, go through. And I think the most important one for us in this conversation is that the small uh, de-risking state allocate, in a sense, delegates or externalizing the pace and nature of decarbonization to private capital and in particular to private uh, finance, it, it, it bribes without disciplining, right? And if you look at, for example, at the research around, uh, and I've done it, there are several colleagues in the room with whom I work, I've worked on this, if you look at, uh, uh, at the debates around the ECB greening policies, you will see that the logic of greening central banking or the logic of decarbonization of private finance is a logic of subsidizing, escorting, encouraging, de-risking, but not penalizing private capital or not penalizing dirty financiers in order to shift resources into uh, greener uh, sectors. And that to me is a, a political consequence of the macroeconomic and macrofinancial regime that is dominating both uh, Europe and the United States, although in, in different forms. And <coughs> why this matters? Well, we have seen it very starkly with the Ukraine crisis. Uh, it's a que the question of energy and for many countries also the question of, of food security. But it also matters because we know allowing private finance to drive the, the decarbonization or the low carbon transition has to be reconciled with what policymakers throughout Europe recognize is systemic greenwashing that is occurring in private finance. So we are not getting the pace we, and we are not getting the kind of decarbonization uh, that we would like to see. When it comes to countries in the global south, because this discourse of de-risking and the, the rise of the de-risking state is not just a sort of Although so I would argue it's a, it's a sort of German invention for the energy market, but it has been exported and, and extended to public goods. Uh, uh, what we see is also a pattern of what I would argue is neocolonial neo extractivism in the sense that it, uh, it encourages or structures the global south countries as consumers, but not producers of green and clean technologies. Um, and 
there, I'm, not, I'm not saying that they are uh, actors without agency. There is a lot of policy debate to be had. And in the Jacobin piece, I look at the example of Uganda that is trying to recreate or, or create in a, with a developmental state angle a, an electric buses industry. But it is much more difficult to do it within the confines of the, uh, uh, this, um, uh, the risking macrofinancial regime. The third consequence, and we see some of its in, uh, uh, effects here in Berlin in uh, housing as an asset class, is that the, the green de-risking state is basically de facto priva privatizing and financializing a variety of public goods, from infrastructure broadly defined to include social infrastructure, uh, to housing, to nature, everything becomes an asset class uh, in the story of, uh, or in the, in the logic of uh, financial capitalism. The third one, and this is probably the most debatable, I mean, most interesting, but also the most controversial one, because it asks us to park some of our uh, intuitions about the state and some of uh, the very obvious empirics of what is happening in, in, in politics. The third one is to go back to the discussions around uh, planning and to think through uh, the, necess the structural necessity, I would argue, although not the political reality of a big green state. In other words, that the, the nature of the climate crisis and the nature of the challenge of structural transformations of economies cannot be delegated to the private uh, capital, cannot be a, a sort of externalized to market-driven processes, but it requires different types of uh, non-market coordinations of private and, and public investment. And here, I think it's very important to distinguish because we've done this presentation before and people say, well, there is not so much difference between the small green state and the big green state. There is a fundamental difference in, in terms of the political economy of how these macrofinancial regimes work because only one macrofinancial regime involves discipline of private capital. By discipline of private capital, I mean, and I have a slide here, I mean both that the state disciplines green industrial winners. It has a well-fleshed out industrial policy, and there is a return, and Antonio is here, he can tell us all about it. There is a return of industrial policy, but in a very different guise. Um, it's a mainstreaming for people who, have, who are feminists and have to follow the trajectory of gender discussions. When they mainstream gender, they emptied it of content. It, in some ways, the same is happening in the big, small green state with uh, industrial policy. But going back, what, it, what matters in, uh, in the third macrofinancial regime is the political ability and the political willingness of the state to discipline private capital. And by disciplining private capital, I mean both the state disciplines green industrial winners uh, so that we don't get the patterns of rent seeking that we have seen in, in certain countries. That, that is a political reality one has to grapple with. But also central banks discipline carbon financiers. And by that, I mean central banks penalize dirty finance in order to shift financial flows into, um, into uh, green activities. And that means, in a sense, both a, accompanying much closer the structural transformation of industries and sectors, but it also means reclaiming public goods from the private financial system, including uh, in the context of where we are today, uh, housing. Um, I will finish with this. I don't know how long I have taken. I will finish with this. Um, there are a, a set of uh, very, um, I, I, sorry, I just wanted to say something about the political coalitions that are supporting these three the different macrofinancial regimes. Uh, the political coalitions behind the carbon shock therapy are not there yet, and they are not, they, they, for, for now there is, uh, I would say, little uh, political opportunity for them in the sense that they would need a renewable sector to mobilize in order to push for carbon shock therapy, at least in, in high income countries. And we have not seen that, that yet. Uh, fossil, entrenched fossil interests are much more powerful. Uh, and that's why, um, uh, incidentally, I just remember that Mario Draghi, the former president of the European Central Bank, has imposed a windfall tax on uh, fossil uh, capital uh, yesterday or, or this morning. So it is possible even from unexpected circles. But in general, the political coalitions that are required to put forward carbon pricing uh, or carbon shock therapy are not there. They might be there in the global south because the IMF and the World Bank are developing 
climate plans or climate frameworks where carbon shock therapy is much more politically uh, possible, uh, not viable, but possible. Uh, the political coalitions behind the small green state are basically uh, the risking blocks led by private finance or by asset managers. And uh, if you don't know uh, Ben's work, you should. He describes in, in a very interesting conceptual detail both the structural power of asset managers towards firm and the infrastructural power of asset managers towards the state. It, it, it is a, a, a an element that we often forget in conversations around decarbonization, the fact that the, the importance of financial capitalism is not that it just it generates recurrent uh, financial crises that become explosive, but it also has the ability to leverage its political power in order to, to um, um, take advantage of crises, and the um, climate crisis is a good example. And, and finally, in relationship to uh, the big green state, the question is how do, how do we get developmental blocks where both the, the ideo there is an ideological consensus that the transformation is necessary and that there, are, there is a structural support for that ideological consensus that includes technocratic Keynesians. In other words, both central bankers and uh, uh, experts in industrial policy and uh, um, technocrats and ministries of finance that can do the technocratic work that is necessary, the bureaucratic work that is necessary to um, uh, have a much better form of state-led uh, coordination uh, and indicative planning. We shouldn't underestimate the importance of ha having good bu bureaucrats uh, when it comes to um, uh, designing or, or state-led green transitions. And I'll finish with these uh, reflections. Uh, may, they may be for future research, for discussion. The, the, the status quo that we have in Europe and in most countries in the Global South is a, the de-risking or the, the small green state paradigm where there is a reimagining of the, the, the state that exercises both its monetary, uh, that uses both its monetary arm and its fiscal arm to do the risking. Uh, and there is a, a, a series of the risking interventions um, that um, uh, one can explore. Can it deliver on its promises? If this is what we have, and it will take a lot of political work uh, to change structurally finance, uh, and we know that some of you in, in this room have tried to do that, um, and we, I would say um, we, the efforts, at least at a political level, have, have not been uh, delivering the kind of successes that we, are, we want. Uh, and this is, these are the questions that come from it. Can the de-risking state uh, deliver without reforming market-based finance, without changing the structural and infrastructural power of institutional capital or of, or of asset managers, without challenging the supremacy of the US dollar? I am very skeptical of stories that somehow promise again the end of the dollar supremacy because uh, of the uh, Russian invasion without changing the, challenging the infrastructural power of finance and under fossilflation. We should not underestimate that the, the, the context where we are at the moment is not just a higher carbon prices or higher fossil fuel prices, but a, a, a fossilflation that is pushing central banks to prioritize inflation and to downgrade their efforts at greening to a level that I, I think we will find, I found some of those efforts disappointing, they are increasingly weaker and weaker because the, without a change in the macrofinancial ar architecture in the relationship between monetary and fiscal policy, we will see inflation uh, sort of uh, ru ru running the game. Um, I, I'm interested in the green coalitions that can morph around uh, the de-risking state, and I suppose that the discussions today and tomorrow will tell us a lot about the green coalitions that are doing the risking now in Germany around natural gas. So that's that's quite interesting. Um, how to think more about carbon shock therapies? We I think we live in one at the moment in in Europe. Uh, its political economy is not very uh, obvious to me. And then to think through maybe a bit more ambitious alternative green macrofinancial regimes that are where that recognize perhaps that capitalism and, and the climate crisis are not compatible with each other. Thank you. And sorry.